we ask more questions, and, I, and, and this is, becomes medical because, you know, when you see something like this, you say, drugs. You can use a drug to make it better, right? This is what, you know, I am a medical doctor after all. It's not my fault. My mother wanted me to be a doctor. Um, and so, so there are two ways by which you can make noisy neurons. One is you can alter the potassium channels. The membrane of the neuron has all kinds of ion channels that regulate the function of the neuron. And if they become too permeable and too much ion is moving in and out, the neuron gets noisy, particularly potassium channels. The, the person who discovered the structure and the function of this channel got the Nobel Prize. This is a very important finding. Or it could be a problem with the synapse. The synapse is the place where one neuron contacts the next neuron in, as part of a circuit. Now, this contact is not structural. There's a space between them, and neurotransmitters have to jump across the space to activate the next neuron. And when too many neurotransmitters are released into the space and activate the next neurons, you get a noisy neuron. And we need to know which one of the two causes is what's causing the noisy neuron in the dyslexia model. So we do uh, an experiment called a transcriptome uh, analysis where we see what happens after we silence this particular gene. What other genes change? Because you can't change one gene without causing a massive reorganization of the function of thousands of other genes. This is why it's a complicated field. So we do an analysis and we see what genes are upregulated. In other words, when you knocked out this particular dyslexia gene, what genes acted more as a result of it and what genes acted less as a result of it. And interestingly enough, we find one little dot here which corresponds to this gene, the NMDA receptor 2B, also known as GRIN2B, which is a synaptic uh, molecule. It changes the properties of the synapse. So we answer the question. It's most likely a change in the synaptic irritability that's causing the noisy neurons. But this is just an association. Is it true? So we block this particular molecule. There are pharmacological agents that we can use to block it. And when we block it, we make the neuron not noisy anymore. So we, we got it. We nailed it. We, we know that this gene, and we don't know exactly how it's doing it, but we know that this gene is changing the synaptic properties of networks and making the neurons noisy. Now, wow, can we treat dyslexia with this? Well, we're far away from that. I can tell you because we don't know if this is happening during development or online later on with the child's reading. When, when is this important? We don't know. Well, I can tell you I have an anecdote. I have one patient who, uh, who came to see me and saying, you know, I've been dyslexic all my life, and then I had a sinus operation, and they gave me an anesthetic, and I was not dyslexic for two days after the surgery. I said, <laughs> Yeah. You were demented for two days after the surgery. <laughs> well, the anesthetic was ketamine, something you can't take by pill. And a ketamine is a blocker of that particular NMDA 2RB receptor. And when I heard that, I went, oh. So I gave him something like it. I gave him something called memantine, which is a drug we give patients with Alzheimer's disease, which is also a blocker of this particular molecule. And he improved. And then he stopped improving. He went back. So I gave him a second one, which is another blocker, which is called atomoxetine. You probably hear it know it as Stratera. We use for for attention deficit, and he got better again. And now he's like on four medications, you know, and he's a very nutty person, and I don't really know if anything has ever worked or was placebo or anything. So I'm not recommending it. 
But it's an interesting observation because it fit the, the, the laboratory observation. And who knows? Something to keep in mind. So let's take some messages home. I think I'm okay with time still. Neuronal migration anomalies may be part of the dyslexic brain, but not necessarily. We have some models in which you, we don't have a neuronal migration anomaly, but you produce some disordered cortical function. Maybe that's what uh, that's what's necessary. And sometimes neuronal migration anomalies are associated with noisy cortical function too. They uh, and I didn't. Uh, I I mentioned it once, and I should have mentioned it again and again. That these cortical abnormalities, even though we start them in the cortex. That's what we address. They produce changes in subcortical structures like the thalamus. They don't stay put. So they're, they're going back toward earlier processing of sound. So what I didn't tell you also, I forgot to tell you, is that when we lesion those rats and the males were affected and the females were not affected, we looked at the thalamus and the females had normal thalamuses and the males had abnormal thalamus. So that lesson was that at least you needed to have a secondary change in the thalamus for you to have the problem. That the cortical injury alone wasn't doing it, at least in that model. So that's shifting us to earlier processors. And that the male and female's different vulnerability, at least in part uh, explained by uh, sex hormones like testosterone. And this is just a tirade of mine to say, look, we have focused very much on the cerebral cortex because that's easy to see. It's like, you know, looking for the key under the light because that's, you can see there, but you know you lost it over there, you know. It's, we look in the cortex a lot when we look at reading because it's easy to work with the cortex. It's not easy to work with the thalamus in living subjects who can activate it easily, it, let alone the brainstem, and you'll start hearing a little bit more about the brainstem in the rest of the talk. Uh, the cortex is important for reading in children and adults, but particularly true in adults. For learning to read, I'm just beginning to tell you that the subcortical structures like the thalamus and structures in the auditory system in the brainstem may be important and even more important because they may be involved in the acquisition of the sound structure of the language. <laughs>